Good morning, First Baptist family. In case we haven't met, my name is Melinda, and I'm the Executive Director for New Beginnings Life Ministries. We are your local Pregnancy Resource Center, providing pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, life-affirming consultations, parenting skills courses, and abstinence education in Washington and the surrounding eight counties. So back in March, when COVID began to shut down businesses, we made the choice to stay open. When Texas moved to essential services only, we stayed open. By the grace of God, New Beginnings has not shut our doors even one day, and we have not had to turn away a single woman in crisis. We are doing things a little differently. We worked with a skeleton crew here at the center for the four or five weeks, with everyone else working from home. Those who worked at home used their time to make care calls to clients to catch up on paperwork and data entry. During that time, we also postponed services to the women who were happy to be pregnant. We did that for their safety and for ours. Plus, honestly, we wanted to be sure that we were here and available for those women in crisis. Do you remember there were some weeks in there when elective surgeries were banned in Texas? That included all abortion procedures. And we literally received hundreds of calls from women whose abortion appointments had been canceled. Now, unfortunately, only a small percentage of those made an appointment with us and actually showed up. And all except one chose life for their baby. Now, we have been sending out parenting education material and video links by text and email to our clients. Then they can take those parenting skill classes on their phone, their tablet, their computer, their smart TV. Uh, they can have other members of their family watch with them. Uh, and then we've been following up with them with phone calls and virtual counseling sessions. Our clients have scheduled many curbside and porch pickups for the diapers and wipes and formula and other baby items that they have earned by taking those classes. This year, so far, we have seen an increase of 112% in classes taken. We believe a lot of that is because they're at home and because we're able to send those links to their electronic devices. And we have seen a 42% increase in material assistance provided. But even more significantly, we are seeing a huge increase in women seeking Bible study and mentoring. Just so far this year, 147 compared to 59 in the same time frame last year. Now, New Beginnings would never want to be a substitute for a client's church family. They need a church body like yours. But it is a blessing for us to walk with them one-on-one -on -one through the challenges of life, especially during these difficult times. Now, there truly is no way that we are going to know how many women may need our services in the coming months. Losses of jobs, quarantines, fewer entertainment opportunities, all of these are going to contribute to more unexpected pregnancies. And so this morning, we want to thank you in advance for your support, because you are going to enable us to continue sharing truth and saving lives. Amen. What a great ministry that uh, God has given those folks. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. Has God been good to you this week? Good, then we're going to stand up and sing about it. So let's stand up. I showed you guys an, a new song a couple of weeks ago, so now we're going to find out how much y'all remember of it, okay? We're going to find out if I remember it. Let's sing. Will all my life, all I know God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go all my life. All I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. And the verse goes like this. God is for me, not against me. I will hold to the plans he has for me when I'm broken. He will fix me. I will call on the name of 
the Lord. Let's sing that chorus. Yeah, all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. And verse 2, he's my heart song. In my sorrow, he's my hope and my strength for tomorrow. When the storm rises all around me, I will call on the name of the Lord. Oh, let's sing that chorus out. Will I all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go all my life. All I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. Here's the bridge. I got joy, joy, joy deep in my soul. Sing. I will sing, sing, sing wherever I go. Let's finish it out with a couple of choruses. Will all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go all my life. All I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. If God's been good to you, say amen. 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 And some people would say, well, what has God done for you that's so good? Well, this song sums it up right here. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my guilty soul. Calvary. At Calvary. That's what we're going to sing about this morning. If, if that was all he ever did for me, that was enough. Let's sing. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. At Calvary, mercy Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There, my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to there my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied. 
Guys, be seated. Well, good morning, choir. You were the only guys that talked to me, so good morning. I'm glad to see you guys. Good morning, church. Told you. Well, I'm glad to see you guys here this morning. We're going to read our Bibles again this morning with the Psalms. And so if you don't have your Bible already, I encourage you to go ahead and get that out this morning. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 17. And again, we use this as a tool to help us to kind of sync our souls together through the Word of God and also sync our hearts up with the Lord Himself this morning. So Psalm 17, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version this morning, so it'll be slightly different than what's on screen, but I'm sure we can all follow along just fine. So let's hear the Word of the Lord this morning. In verse 1 it says, Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer for my lips free of deceit. From your presence let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me, and you will find nothing. I have purpose that my mouth will not transgress. With regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge, for your adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager, eager to tear as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord. Comfort him. Oh, I'm sorry. Confront him. Subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wick wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are sa satisfied with children, and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. And so this morning, as we come into our time of prayer, I encourage you to think um, there are men and women in our church who have recently lost loved ones. That's always a hard thing. You know, we are coming up on the holiday season very soon. You know, if you've been through that, that's especially a hard time. And so I encourage you to take a few moments and to pray uh, for people like Vinnie Martell, who lost her mother this morning, and to pray for others in our church who are like her. If you don't know what to pray this morning, you just can't think of something, I encourage you to use this psalm as a prayer. Is verse 15 true of your heart? That you're going to one day behold his righteousness, that one day you will awake and be satisfied in his likeness. That's the blessed hope of the church. Is that your hope? And so let's use this next few moments here as a time of prayer. I'm encouraging you now to bow your head, close your eyes, and seek the Lord. And then I'll come and pray for us in the end time. Would you pray now, please? Father, the quietness of this moment can be awkward at times. Yet it's so often in the quiet moments that you work. And so, Lord, I thank you for this time where we can come together uh, with similar hearts, with similar minds, uh, to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I do pray for Vanita this morning. Uh, unimaginably hard to lose a mom. And so, Lord, I pray that you would comfort her 
that you would strengthen her, that you would strengthen her family. Lord, it's is so often said that life would come out of this death, that if there's someone in her circle who does not know you, that they could come to know you through this time. Lord, I'm just latching on to verse 7 this morning where you says that you wondrously show your steadfast love. And God, you have done that over and over again in my life and I'm sure in the lives of many in this room. And so I'm just asking, would you do it again today? Would you show us in here how truly magnificent you are, how wonderful and wondrous you are? Father, as we continue to lift up our voices in song, as we continue to make much of your name, would you just incline our hearts into deeper relationship with you? Would you draw us in as only you can? Lord, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let's continue to lift up the Lord with our voices this morning. Stand with us. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. King of my heart, be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in my waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good. Good, oh, 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 you are good, good, oh, 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 you are good, good, oh, 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 you are good, good, oh, oh, oh. you're never going to never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down sing that again you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you are good good oh Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. 
Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, feel my life again, I give my life to follow, everything I believe in, now I Shine your light, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King, oh, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say. He is mighty to say forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Yes, Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say, He is mighty to say forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. You did conquer the grave. You conquered hell, death, and the grave, and you did it all for us, Lord, and your goodness is more than we could ever ask for. It's more than we ever deserve, and we thank you that you give it to us freely. God, speak to us this morning as Mel brings this message, and uh, just speak, pray you speak to every heart that's here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be seated. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Uh, so we uh, invite you this morning to uh, open your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 10. Uh, as you came in, you might have noticed uh, that Mrs. Detmer, Mr. and Mrs. Detmer set up the, a little table out front there uh, where you can, uh, with some voter registration cards uh, for you to fill out. If you haven't registered to vote, uh, you have the opportunity to, to do so. And uh, I believe there's Waller County represented there, Austin County and Washington County. So if you live in one of those counties nearby, uh, be sure to register to vote if you haven't done so. And immediately following this service and until 
uh, shortly after the second service, there will be a lady out there who would be happy to assist you with that. Uh, you can fill out the card, give it to her, and she will take the, the, uh, uh, the cards to the courthouse and, and go ahead and get you registered. These things are due by October 5th, but she will see to it that they are turned in tomorrow, and you'll be registered to vote. And if you need assistance, of course, she's out there to help you with that. Certainly want to encourage you to do that. Well, good morning and uh, uh, welcome, and if you're watching from home, we're glad to have you join us. Of course, we do have services here on Sundays from uh, at 8.30 and at 11 o'clock, so uh, if you haven't ventured out and uh, uh, into a, a personal worship service yet, we certainly want to invite you to come and join us whenever you're comfortable doing so. Uh, this morning, we are in Revelation chapter 10, and uh, it's been an interesting journey so far uh, through the book of Revelation. And uh, we've traveled through some very dark and difficult passages uh, to this point in chapter 10. And uh, through the ages, uh, we're, we're dealing with a question that's been asked through the ages. Uh, how much longer? Christians have asked that question uh, ever since Jesus ascended back to heaven 2,000 years ago. How much longer? How much longer will God wait? How much longer will He put up with the wickedness of this world? How much longer will it... B, before he pours out his judgment and Christ returns to the earth to reclaim all that is rightfully his. How long? Christians have asked that question again throughout the ages. Uh, we've asked that question. Uh, even the martyrs who were under the, the altar in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, asked that question. How long? And uh, the Lord has promised that the day will come. And the coming of that day is connected to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. We see that in our passage this morning, Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Uh, it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants the prophet. The day is coming, and the coming of that day is tied to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. It says in Revelation chapter 11, verses 14 to 15, with the sounding of that trumpet, it says, Then the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. And so the sounding of the seventh trumpet signals the return and reign of Jesus Christ to the earth. Now, last week, we looked at the fifth and sixth trumpets. And before the seventh trumpet sounds, we have an interlude, a pause in the action. And that's what's going on here in chapter 10, this pause, this interlude, this break in the action. It gives us the opportunity to catch our breath. It gives us the opportunity to kind of uh, come to grips with everything that we've been looking at. And this is kind of the pattern of the book. Uh, we've seen it with each of these series of seven judgments so far. They're, they're all laid out similarly. You've got the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. And in each of these series of seven, you have the first four judgments, which bear their own similarities to one another. And then with the fifth and sixth judgments, well, you have a drastic turn, a, a, a very stark difference between the fifth and sixth judgments uh, in, the, in the first four and then between the 6th and 7th judgment, there is this interlude, this opportunity to, uh, for us to gather our senses before we move forward. Uh, then with, you know, This is how it's been progressing. We've seen it. Uh, the, the first four seals. We had the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And then we had the 5th and 6th seals, which were very different. An interlude, then the 7th seal. And contained within the 7th seal are the seven trumpets. The first four trumpets were, well, they were all similar to one another. And then as we saw last week with the fifth and sixth trumpets, a very dramatic turn in the way the judgment was poured out. And then finally this morning we come to this interlude. And then uh, next week we'll get into the seventh trumpet. And with the seventh trumpet comes the seven bowl judgments. The first four, the same pattern will play out. The first four bowls will be similar to one another. Fifth and sixth bowls take a dramatic turn. And then an interlude before the final bowl is poured out. And uh, the interlude today uh, between the sixth and seventh trumpet, well, it starts here in chapter 10, goes all the way to chapter 11, verse 14. And this is what John records here. We have, it's a twofold interlude, really. We have two scenes going on here. We're dealing with the first one this morning, and this is what John says. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. 
And the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven pills of thunder has spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophet. Then the voice which I had heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was as sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. All right, so John says that he sees another strong angel, another one. Uh, Because of the way the angel is described here, some believe that this angel is actually Jesus. But I don't think that this angel is actually Jesus. Every time Jesus appears in this book, it's pretty evident that it's, it's him. Uh, uh, there's usually a title of some sort associated with his appearance, a title that can only refer to him, and usually there's something going on in the scene that tells us that it has to be Jesus. Jesus shows up whenever it has to be Jesus. Jesus shows up and he does things that only Jesus can do. Jesus shows up and does, and whenever, well, whenever an angel or somebody else simply won't do. All right, So uh, it's unambiguous. Uh, it's necessary that it's Jesus. He doesn't just show up in a scene whenever somebody else could show up and do whatever it is that's going on. Furthermore, that John says that uh, what he says, well, he says that he sees here another angel, another strong angel. He's already seen one. Uh, that was back in chapter 5, verse 2. And there's no question that what he saw ch- back in chapter 5, verse 2 was an angel. If what he sees here is Jesus, then referring to him as another strong angel would only confuse things. Furthermore, on top of that, in the Greek language, there are two words that are typically translated in the New Testament as another. One speaks of another in a very general sense. One speaks of another in a very specific sense. So you can have another angel, just an angel in general, or you can have another angel of the same kind. That's the distinction between the two words that are translated as another. For example, if I made a mess of my shirt this morning before I stood up into the pulpit, I might call my wife and say, I need you to bring me another shirt. Well, she could take that to mean just about anything. I've got all kinds of shirts. I have T-shirts, I have polo shirts and pullovers or whatever, button downs, whatever. I could just say, just bring me another shirt. And if she brought me just a T-shirt, well, she would have fulfilled that expectation. But I would probably tell her to be a little more specific. I need another shirt of the same kind that I currently have, except for the stain. So that's kind of what we've got going on here. Jesus, or John says, I see another strong angel. Which another is he using? Well, he's using the word another that speaks of another of the same kind. So in referring back to the other angel, he says, I see another one. I see another angel of the same kind. This is an angel of the same kind as as I saw back in chapter 5, verse 2, which tells us that it cannot possibly be Jesus. It has to be another angel similar to the one in chapter 5. So this angel isn't Jesus. And in his description of the angel, John says several things. First, he says he's clothed with a cloud. Now, in the Old Testament, clouds are often symbolic of God's glory. And uh, that this angel is clothed in a cloud is symbolic of, uh, well, it's, it's God's, he's wrapped in God's glory. He's, he's, God's presence is with him. Second, he has a rainbow upon his head. And we've seen this already, too, in the book of Revelation. A rainbow symbolic of God's mercy. His face was like the sun, John says. 
This seems reminiscent of the book of Exodus whenever Moses went up on Mount Sinai. Remember, he spent all that time in the presence of God, and he came down, and his, his face was shining because having spent time in the presence of the Lord. And his face was shining so brightly that the people couldn't look upon it. So they had to put a veil over Moses' face just so they could look in his direction without being blinded. And so here this angel comes from the presence of God, and his face is shining like the sun. And finally, John says his feet were like pillars of fire, which may be yet another allusion to the Exodus. When God led his people through the wilderness in a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And so while this angel is not Jesus, everything that John describes about his appearance serves in some way to remind us of the glory and power uh, of God and that the final deliverance of God's people is at hand. Now, we're told in verse 2 that the strong angel had a little book in his right hand, and it was open. Word translated there is little book, literally translates as little scroll. It's uh, a similar word to the word that's just translated typically as scroll, but it's, it's a little different in that the word little, the idea of little is built into the word. It's a diminutive form of the word scroll. It's a little scroll. And as this angel descends to the earth with this open scroll in his right hand, he plants one foot on the land, one foot in the sea. Uh, that's an authoritative stance. And what it suggests is that this little scroll, the message of this little scroll in his hands, has uh, relevance to the entire world. All the world needs to hear this message. All the world needs to take notice of this message. And John says, The angel cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. You ever been close to a lion when he roars? Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about hearing one on television. I'm talking about hearing a lion, being there when a lion roars. Um, You know, uh, we used to take the kids to the zoo when they were little, and uh, the lions were always one of my favorite. That's always just been a favorite thing for me at the zoo. And uh, typically you go to the zoo and you see them, they're, they're just, they just lay around, you know. I mean, <laughs> they just lay there. And, uh, you know, they don't do anything. And th- they just lay around. But I remember one particular day, Pamela and I took the kids to the zoo, and one of the males was up walking around and he was roaring and I'm telling you this this lion you know probably 50 feet away in an enclosure he couldn't get me but I'm telling you when I heard that lion roar it made it it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck I mean the the sound of a lion roar that's not just the sound you hear that's a sound you feel right you, you, that's a sound you feel, okay? This is a sound that, that, that absolutely seizes the attention. You can't ignore the sound of a lion roaring. And uh, that's, this, that's this, the, the voice of this angel. That's how John describes the voice of this angel. It's, it's like the sound of a roaring lion. It commands the attention. And after the angel cried out with this loud, roaring voice, John says that the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And just as he was about to write down what the seven thunders said, a voice from heaven spoke and said, don't write that down. Of course, John's commission has been to write down what he sees and hears. He hears the seven thunders, a voice says, don't write that down. Uh, This is interesting. If we didn't know any better, we might think that the seven thunders slipped up that they uttered some things that they weren't supposed to utter, and then, whoops, oh, maybe we shouldn't have said that. And then a voice chimes in from heaven very quickly, oh, oh no, no, don't write that down. You weren't supposed to hear that. But that, that's, that we might be inclined to think that some sort of a mistake has happened here. But there's no mistake here, all right? This is not a slip-up. This all happens just as God wants it to happen. He wanted the seven thunders to speak. He wanted John to hear the seven thunders speak. And he wanted to be able to tell John, don't write those things down. And he wanted for us to be able to read about that event today. And you wonder why. Why does God want us to know that John heard something and when they was told not to write it down for us to hear? Well, I think that what's going on here is that God wants us to understand that He has shown us a lot, but He has not shown us everything. There's a lot more going on in the pouring out of all this judgment. There's more going on to the breaking of these seven seals and the sounding of these seven trumpets and what we're going to see with the pouring out of these seven bowls. There's much more going on than what we're being allowed to know. 
And of course, we know from all that we've seen, I mean, this has been some heavy stuff. Last Sunday particularly was, was some of the heaviest stuff I think I've, I've ever, I've, I don't think I've ever preached on anything heavier than what we looked at last Sunday, just in terms of temporal earthly judgment. We found ourselves shocked by it all. I mean, writing the sermon last week was one thing, preaching it was another. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, it, 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 boy, it's, it's, it's crazy stuff. The fifth and sixth trumpets, I mean, it, they were shocking. Uh, and with the, the, the sealing of the words of the seven thunders, I think what we're supposed to understand here is, look, that the, the, the things during the time, that time, that, that, that time of tribulation are going to be far more devastating for the unrepentant than what we've been told. And so God's saying, look, I've shown you a lot, but I haven't shown you everything because you know what, quite frankly, you can't handle it. It's much more tragic than what you realize. And I mean, again, quite frankly, it's a struggle to fathom and process the, the things that we looked at just last week. Um, verse 5, the angel lifts up his right hand in the little scroll to heaven. He's got the, the little scroll in his right hand, so when he lifts up his right hand, that little scroll's in it, and he sw it says he swore by him who lives forever and ever, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, the God of the sea. And the thing that he swore as he held up his right hand is that there will be, be delay no longer. There will be delay no longer. The one true and living God who reigns supreme over all that exists is about to reclaim it. That's the pledge. Now, the people of God have anticipated this moment since the day that Jesus ascended back to heaven 2,000 years ago. His return in our final exodus into glory, that, that's an exciting prospect. In fact, His return and reclamation of the earth is the substance of all our hope. It's the substance of all our hope. But while the, this event is the most exciting thing and imaginable to us, and we anticipate it, we look forward to it, it's the fulfillment of our great hope, it will be unimaginably tragic and devastating for the unrepentant. And we need to be reminded of that. As we hear about these things unfolding, we need to take these, this, this devastation and this tragedy to heart. The return of Christ will be once, all at once, it'll be the sweetest and yet the most bitter event to ever happen in all of human history, depending upon which side of this thing you're on. So the voice that speaks from heaven that told John to seal up the utterances, the seven thunders spoke again, this time telling him to take the little book from the hand of the strong angel. Eat the, eat the book. Go get the book. So imagine John going to get that little scroll out of the, little angel, or out of the big angel's hand. And, I mean, you know, it's, it's, and again, that scroll, it's, there's, there's debate about the scroll as there is everything else in this book. Is it the same scroll Jesus received back in chapter 5? I don't think it's the same scroll. This one's called a little scroll. You think if it was the same scroll he received back in chapter 5, he would be told to take the scroll. Uh, this one seems to be a different one. Uh, calling it a little scroll, if we're meant to understand it as the same scroll Jesus received, then well, calling it a little one here would be just, it would just be a confusing thing, I think. But anyways, whether it is or isn't is almost irrelevant. It could be that the very thing that John is receiving here is the book of Revelation as we understand it. The very thing he's writing, interestingly enough. Anyway, he's told to take the little book. And so he goes up to the angel and he says, give me the little book. <laughs> that, that's kind of a daunting thought, really. I mean, you've got this colossal angel standing there with one foot on this, on this dry land, one in the ocean. And when he speaks, he roars like a lion. And he's going up and he's telling him, hey, give me the book. <laughs> the angel says, here. Take it and eat it. It's going to taste sweet like honey in your mouth. But it's going to make your stomach bitter. This is a direct allusion to Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8, to chapter 3, verse 3. In those few verses in that passage, God spoke to Ezekiel saying, now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Talking about Israel. 
Open your mouth and eat what I'm giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. And when he had spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Direct allusion to what Ezekiel experienced. That's what John experiences in Revelation 10. And uh, we're told that as he ate the scroll, just as the, it, it, it happened just as it, the angel said it would happen. It happened just as Ezekiel experienced it. It tasted sweet in his mouth. But at the end, he needed some Rolaids. It made his stomach bitter. It gave him indigestion. It put a knot in his stomach. It tasted good, but it made him feel sick. What's going on here? What's with this business of eating scrolls and tasting like honey and making you sick to your stomach? Well, of course, the little scroll, the little book is a word from God. And it's not an unusual thing to find in Scripture the Word of God likened to food. You find it again and again and again. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus in the wilderness with Satan, that temptation. Uh, Jesus says to Satan, quoting uh, uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Word of God is real sustenance. It's real bread. It's real spiritual sustenance. Nourishment. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, Jeremiah declared, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. 1 Peter 2, verse 2, Peter described God's word as pure milk. Then Psalm chapter 119, verse 103, the longest chapter in the Bible, says something that comes very close to John's experience. How sweet are your words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's God's word in the life of the believer. Here in Revelation 10, John eats the scroll. He eats God's word, and that's a symbolic action. It's a symbolic action. It symbolizes acceptance of it and assimilation of it into one's own life. Just as as when, when you eat food, your body takes it in, your body digests it, and that body contributes, or that, that food contributes to your body and your growth and your development in some way, your nourishment. There's a sense in which that food becomes a part of you. And so it is whenever you feed on God's word, you take it in, and it becomes a part of who you are. It begins to develop you and shape you and nourish you and transform you. So this idea of eating God's word speaks of taking it in, digesting it in a spiritual sense, and it becoming a part of you. That old saying, you are what you eat, look, it pertains perhaps more profoundly to what you feed your mind on than what you feed your body on. Feeding on the Word of God involves internalizing and allowing it to change the way you think and reshape the way that you interact with God and others, the way that you live your life in general. That's the power of God's Word in the lives of people. It's real spiritual food, and when we feed on it, we experience spiritual growth. You know, many Christians don't experience spiritual growth, and they don't know why. They don't understand, boy, I've been a Christian all these years. My life doesn't look any different than it used to. Or perhaps they grew for a little bit, but they're not growing anymore, and they wonder why. The answer is because they're not feeding on the Word of God. That's it. That's the long and the short of it. That's the answer in a nutshell. Regardless of everything else you might do for spiritual nourishment, the fact of the matter is, is it all falls rather flat whenever the Word of God is devoid from your life, whenever you're not feeding on the Word of God. That's not to say these other things are useless or meaningless, prayers, church, giving, whatever. I mean, whatever the discipline is that you're involving yourself in, if you're not feeding on God's Word, you're not going to grow. Real spiritual growth and development hinges entirely upon the amount of time. It hinges upon you spending significant time in the Word of God. And we're not just talking about reading the Bible. There's more to this than simply reading the Bible. 
talking about feeding on it. Big difference. Big difference. Feeding on it involves meditating on it, pondering on it, turning it over again and again in your mind, getting a real understanding of it, allowing it to cause the way you think to come in line with the way God Himself thinks. And whenever you think the way, whenever you begin to think the way that God Himself thinks, the way you live, way you live your life begins to look like the way that Jesus Christ Himself lived His life. That's how this works. Your life's not going to come into agreement with the character and will of God if you're not meditating, feeding regularly on the Word of God. Again, all those other things that you do, as good as they are, they're not going to bear as much impact in your life as they can if, if you're not steadily feeding on the Word of God. The only ones who grow spiritually are the ones who feed on the Word of God. John ate the scroll, he found it to be sweet in his mouth. But as he digested it, the message, he pondered it. He pondered its implications. And it made his stomach bitter. It put a knot in his stomach. The message of God's love and reconciliation in Jesus Christ is a sweet thing. The promises of Christ for the faithful are sweet things. The anticipation, the promise of his return to the earth, that's, that's a sweet, sweet promise. An inheritance in his kingdom, reigning with him, these are all sweet, sweet things. But the message of coming wrath and judgment, that is a very, very bitter thing. It is something that ought to put a knot in your stomach. Even as a believer, one who has escaped the coming wrath, the fact that there are many who have not escaped the coming wrath or who will not escape the coming wrath ought to put a knot in your stomach. Judgment and wrath aren't easy messages to digest. They're not easy messages to deal with. They're not easy messages to preach. Trust me, I got, I've had knots in my stomach over the last several weeks. We, we've looked at all the wrath poured out. It leaves knots in your stomach. I mean, it's, I mean, I love God's Word. I love all of God's Word. But these aren't easy things to talk about. As sweet as it is to me, the, these chapters have left me with knots in my stomach, and, I, and they probably left you with knots in your stomachs too. I mean, you know, Keith coming down here last Sunday, well, that was a cheery sermon. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not cheery things. They ought to leave knots in our stomachs. Christians ought to be moved by the things that we've been looking at. But you know, sometimes Christians aren't moved by the things that we're looking at. I think the general consensus, particularly among Baptists, is that the church won't be here when the tribulation begins. And because you know, we have this idea the church won't be here, well, these things really don't pertain to us. We don't have to worry. You know, the church will be raptured away before then. You know, look, for those who don't know what that means, the rapture speaks of Christ removing His church from the earth. He just supernaturally removes His church from the earth. And again, there's debate on when these things happen. Will it happen before the tribulation starts? Will it happen at the end of the tribulation? Will it happen in the middle? That, you know, I think many, perhaps most, uh, believe that the, 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 the tribulation is going to happen before, or the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation begins. And so with that assumption, many Christians look at chapters like we've been looking at and figure, hey, we're not going to be here when it happens, so there's no need for us to worry about it. Quite frankly, I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I think I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. I've kind of flow against the grain in that way. Uh, cast out of the bag. <laughs> In case you've been wondering, yeah, I don't believe in it. I'm more of a post-trib kind of guy, and we'll talk more about that whenever pertinent passages come to bear on the situation. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But whatever the case, the idea of people coming under the wrath and condemnation of God, whether we're here or not, is something that ought to break our hearts. It ought to be something that we are not comfortable with. It ought to at least leave us with a knot in our stomach. How can we be fine with the people coming under the wrath of God? 
How can we be okay with that even though we're escaping it? Well, hey, at least I'm not a part of it. I mean, that can't be the attitude that we have here. I mean, surely we ought to be glad about escaping the wrath of God, but being fine with others perishing is something that ought to devastate us. I mean, even the fact that the seven thunders speak and John's not allowed to tell us what they said, tell, I mean, my goodness, this is much, much worse than we could ever imagine. I mean, what we're studying here in the book of Revelation, this is the closest we will ever come to understanding the wrath of God against our own sin. Thankfully, we've been rescued from it, but this is as close to comprehending it as we will ever be, those of us who are saved. God says, look, it's worse than you can imagine. And so how can we just shrug our shoulders and, 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 comfort, our, and comfort, comfort ourselves with the idea that we won't be here for it? We've got to do something. We've got to say something. But what do we say? How do we know what to say? John ate the scroll, and he knew what to say. He fed on the Word of God, and he knew what to say. In eating the scroll, he's taking the message of God into himself for the purpose of carrying it to others. He took God's Word in so that he would know what to say. We can't share God's Word if we don't know God's Word. You know, it's estimated that more than 60% of Christians never share their faith with anyone. I think the number's probably higher. But at least by one estimate, around 60% never share their faith with anyone. They never share the gospel message. They never lead another person to Christ. And that's tragic. It's tragic. And the two reasons often named for this failure are fear and not knowing what to say. I think they kind of go hand in hand. God told John, look, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. How is he going to know what to say to them? Well, we know. He ate the scroll. He fed himself on, on God's word, and that gave him the words he would need to tell others. Because he fed on God's word, he was carrying within himself everything he would need in going to all these peoples and nations and kings The message was in him. If you're one who's never, just never shares your faith, it's possible this is because you don't know what to say. And if you don't know what to say, well, that's probably because you don't feed yourself on God's word. If you feed yourself on God's word, you feed on his word. You're not going to be at a loss for what to say to anyone about Jesus Christ. You're not going to be at a loss. And not being at a loss for what to say can go a long way towards dispelling the fear that often goes along with telling others about Christ. Perhaps not all the fear, but at least some of it. So John eats the scroll for the purpose of taking God's message to others. It was a sweet experience at first, but it made his stomach bitter. It made his stomach bitter because the message was one of coming wrath and judgment and because he knew that many people, perhaps even most, would reject it. He knew that most would reject it. You know, uh, on, on the one hand, we're glad to know that God's going to destroy sin and put, let's put Satan away, put his demons away forever, forever and ever. But on the other hand, it's gut-wrenching to know that so many people will stubbornly reject Christ and face an eternal hell. Hell, a place that is described as the place where the, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, as we're going to see. That grieves God. And it ought to grieve us. It's not a happy message. It's the bad news of Scripture. The bad news. The bad news is that God hates sin and that we're all sinners. And he has a holy wrath stored up for sinners. The good news is, is he loves sinners. 
and he does not want them to be the objects of his wrath. And so he came to this earth in human flesh for the purpose of dying on a cross. And in his, in his, his willful act of dying on that cross, he took his own wrath against our sin upon himself. The full wrath that he has for my sin, he took upon himself on that cross, thereby making it possible for me to be free. Well, how do you avail yourself of that? Well, you avail yourself of what he did on the cross by recognizing, one, I'm a sinner deserving of that full wrath. Two, committing to turn away from my sin and place my life into the hands of Jesus Christ. And then the idea of placing your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, making this great exchange, he takes your sin and the wrath of God and gives you freedom and righteousness in return. Then that great exchange involves... You truly giving yourself to Him. Look, we can't make people's decisions for them. The only thing we can do is remain, resolve to remain faithful with God's message, not only to accept it and assimilate it into our own lives, but also to talk to others about it when God provides the opportunities for us to do that. We're living in the days of His grace, and the opportunities are there. They abound. He doesn't expect us to create the opportunities. The opportunities are there. He expects us to recognize them. We're in the days of His grace. He's demonstrating patience, delaying His wrath. Let's not waste the time because His patience will soon run out and there will be no more delay. I'm going to invite you to stand with me I want to pray for you in this time of decision. I'll be standing down here. Matthew will be standing down here. and You've got a decision to make this morning during this time of, of reflection and response. I want you to make your decision. If you need someone to talk to, to pray with you, Matthew and I, again, we're right down here, happy to do those things, happy to talk to you. If you need to make a decision to trust Christ, if you've trusted Christ, but you've never followed through a baptism, an important first step in this journey of faith, come talk to us. If you've been visiting for some time and you wish to become a member, this is a, you know, this is a good time to talk about that. Or if you would just simply wish to come to the altar and kneel and pray alone and not be bothered, we'll allow you to do that as well. Let me pray for you. Father, we're so thankful to you for your word. It's the sweetness of its beautiful promises for the redeemed. And Lord, we're even thankful to you for those parts that are not so sweet, the bitter parts, the announcements of coming judgment and wrath. Because we recognize that in those announcements of coming judgment and wrath, there's grace tied up in it, an invitation to turn and be saved, an invitation to receive blessing and an inheritance and in exchange. Lord, as your children... We pray that you would help us to assimilate your word into our own lives, that we might truly learn to think like you and behave like Christ. And Lord, in the assimilation of your word into our own lives, we pray that our compassion for one another, and for the unredeemed, for those who are still under your wrath, we pray that that compassion would only grow, that you would stir our hearts, that we might share the compassion you have for them. May we not grow so content and complacent in our salvation that we're of no use to the growth and expansion of your kingdom to the glory of Christ and to the de declaration of salvation in his name. Or as we seek to tune our hearts with that of the Holy Spirit and hear, his, hear what it is that he has to challenges us with this morning. I pray, God, that you would give us a deep, deep sensitivity to him. And Lord, a simple resolve now before we even understand what it is he's going to show us to follow him. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. 
where sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. come my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Thank you guys again, and uh, before we dismiss, uh, some great news to share with you, and, uh, and uh, we're wondering how to do this, we're trying to, in case you haven't noticed, we're kind of doing the ending a little differently. Uh, uh, I don't know if you met Ray and Jane Knowles, uh, they've been visiting us for a few weeks, and uh, they've made the decision to, this is the place that God has called them to, to be a part of the fellowship, and so uh, we are so thankful for your decision, and uh, we're very glad to have you guys, and uh, we're going to have them right out here, outside the door with me here in just a moment, so as you walk out, uh, you know, say hi, give a fist bump, and uh, uh, welcome them, would you? Uh, let me pray for you. Father, uh, we're, we're so thankful to you for your grace and your goodness and the many ways that you make it manifest to us. And uh, Days such as this when we have the opportunity to fellowship and feed on your word, we, we feel it. We feel your blessing. We sense your presence among us, and it's a sweet, sweet thing. And Lord, we're thankful, we're thankful to you again for your time and your, our time and your presence and your word. We pray that you would help us to assimilate these things truly into our lives, that we may, might be like Christ through this world in some way greater than we have been. And uh, Lord, we're thankful for Mr. and Mrs. Knowles and the decision they've made to join this fellowship, an affirmation of your good work among us and, and a terrific blessing, a gift of your love to us. I pray that you help us be good stewards in our relationship with them and our ministry to them and alongside them. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.